Good morning. Good morning. Happy snowy St. Patrick's Day. We've got a few green uh, people <laughs> here this morning. Uh, and I want to say on this it's beautiful snowy morning. First of all, welcome. I'm guessing there maybe are some people joining us online that might normally be here. And I want to confess right away that if I didn't have to be here, I would be watching on YouTube this morning. <laughs> but it's good to be here with all of you. The snow is beautiful, and certainly we are thankful for the moisture. So grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to worship here at White Rock Presbyterian Church. It is indeed good to be able to be here together. As we gather this morning, I uh, do invite you to be mindful of this land on which we gather uh, that was cared for, that number one is a gift to us from God. Uh, along with all of the beautiful nature that comes from the land and, and now is coming to the land, the snow. Uh, and we also are grateful for and acknowledge all those who cared for the land for, um, for thousands of years uh, before we got here. And we can only hope that we continue to care for the land well. I invite you now as we continue to move into our time of worship to take a little bit more time to move from getting here to being here to becoming a little more uh, centered a little more present here uh, with one another and certainly in the presence of the divine so take a couple of minutes do what you need to do uh, to become more present here in this space and time I'd like to invite Joyce up now to lead us in some uh, in our opening words. Good morning. We light we light a light in the name of the creator who created and loves the world and breathes life into us. We light a light in the name of the Son who redeemed the world and showed the reality of God through his unfailing love. We light a light in the name of the Spirit who encompasses the world and blesses our souls with yearning. We light three lights for the trinity of love, God above us, God beside us, God within us. Amen. Let us sing together the gathering song of Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling, hymn number 418.
let us <clears throat> gather with prayer. Dear God, we thank you for everyone gathered here this snowy morning and ask that you surround us with your powerful, life changing presence. Thank you for loving each of us and for calling us to walk with you. We come before you as we meet and declare our dependence on you. Be a lamp to, onto our feet and a light onto our path. Fill our hearts with your love. Fill our words with conversations, with truth and grace. We ask all these things in praise and adoration of you. Amen. So there aren't any little ones in the corner, so if Griffin can pull up the slides, that'd be fantastic. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I grew up in a community, and, and this is, I should, I always want to adjust because there's no any little kids, and I should think there might be small ones online. Today is St. Patrick's Day to celebrate St. Patrick who brought Christianity to Ireland, and I had to do a little research background on it, but he used the three-leaf clover to bring and remind the people of the Trinity. Next slide, Griffin. And so it is God the Creator, God the Son, which is Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. But as I looked at it, we also look as a shamrock today as a four-leaf clover, and I'm thinking, you Griffin, next slide. Why is a four-leaf clover so interesting? Yes, it is rare to find a four-leaf clover, and it's considered good luck. But I thought what was really interesting and could be really interesting and makes it such good luck, and combined with the Trinity, is because the fourth clover involves us. And that's our relationship with God the Creator, God the Son, Jesus Christ, God the Holy Spirit, and us. That's what makes the combination so lucky. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together on this day of celebrating someone who shared your story with lots of other people and gave us, brought, us, brought our attention to a symbol that can help us remember about you, our, your son, and the Holy Spirit that is among us each day. Thanks for making us feel and be so lucky. Amen. Let us now sing the Jesus Loves Me song. I love that image of the four-leaf clover. Uh, in the context of knowing ourselves loved by God, by Jesus, and by the Spirit, I invite you now to move with me into this time of confession, a time for us to just simply be honest uh, with ourselves in the presence of one another and before God. I invite you to move with me into this time by singing verse one of this hymn of confession, number 423. And again, Connie, just play the tune for us to refresh our memories. Oh. 
begin this season of Lent, we are invited to examine our hearts and our lives to see what is growing and what needs pruning, what needs encouragement and what needs to be rooted out, what needs to be given life and what needs to die. So let us come before God and see what we see and offer to God all that we find, opening our spirit to the one who loves us tenderly and fiercely, gently and relentlessly, and above all, without condition or end. Let us pray. Holy God, giver of life and forgiver of sin, we come to you now with trust, trusting that you will always love us, trusting that you will not hold our sin against us, trusting that you will nudge us to turn from what is evil toward what is good. Walk with us through this holy season, almighty God, and give us the courage and humility to look clearly at our own hearts and minds and lives, as well as the world around us, that we may embrace ourselves and all of your creation with kindness, compassion, and love. We offer to you, O God, with humility and with courage, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's joy is ours for the taking, for the receiving, as we continue to receive God's gift of forgiveness. Beloved of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as people who have been forgiven by God, may we also experience at least something of God's peace I do invite you as we now stand and sing, stand as you are able in body or spirit as we sing this hymn, uh, what is the name of the hymn? Oh, Peace of God Be With You. I invite you to stand and sing that hymn and to greet one another as we sing with some sign of the peace of Christ. I think that's a particularly uh, wonderful song to be singing at this time um, because as you could see the words were in English, in Hebrew, and in Arabic. Uh, so we can be mindful as we sing that hymn of all of the faiths and the peoples that that hymn represents. And we can certainly be, uh, as we will in a little bit, praying for offering our prayers for peace for all of those peoples and certainly for all of the world. 
Uh, I'd like to invite Joyce up again. She's going to uh, lead us in our prayer for illumination and in the scripture reading. Let us pray. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Today's reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and this is the New International Version. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. So as I have mentioned, for three of the past four Sundays, this year's Hebrew Bible or Old Testament lectionary readings throughout the season of Lent have all been uh, focused, have been focused. Griffin, I'm not using it. There we go. Um, Maybe, let me see if that's going to be you or me. That's going to be. It's not turned on. Ah, now it works. Now it works. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, all of the Hebrew Bible readings have been focused on the five foundational covenants that God has made with God's people. We're going to have a very, very quick review, since, especially since last week we moved away from this theme of covenants. The definition that we've been using of the word covenant is this. Covenants define obligations and commitments but they are different from a contract because they are relational and personal. In other words, the parties involved in a covenant, when when two different parties or more make a covenant, they're not legally bound to honor their commitments. Rather, their commitments spring from the relationship that exists between them. So we're gonna take a very quick review through the covenants that we have already looked at. The first Sunday of Lent, Does anybody remember what that covenant was? With whom God made that covenant? Noah. Noah. Oh my gosh. Noah. Represented here by the rainbow. God made a covenant between uh, God's self and all flesh that is or ever would be on the earth to never again use a flood to destroy the earth. On the second Sunday of Lent, we heard about God's covenant with? Abraham. Abraham. You guys get gold stars. Abraham, uh, represented here by the sand and by the twinkly lights, which represent the stars. When Abraham Abraham was how old? When 99. God was 99. He started, the, God, the covenant started when Abraham was 99, what, 75. God called him to leave. But when Abraham was 99 and his wife Sarah was 90, and they didn't have any children of their own, God promised to make Abraham exceedingly fruitful. And saying that he said that nations and kings would come from Abraham through his offspring, and God would establish an everlasting covenant where God would be God to Abraham and all of his offspring forever and ever and ever, amen. 
On the third Sunday of Lent, we heard about the covenant God made with Moses, who was, I don't know, he, he must have been 80. Maybe he was 280, we don't know. Uh, and the Israelites on Mount Sinai, represented here by the scrolls with the numbers on them, because it took the form, that covenant took the form of the giving of what we typically refer to and know as the Ten Commandments. And in this covenant, God promised again to remain faithful. Despite the Israelites' fickleness in their faithfulness, and despite their very consistent wavering in their commitment to God, God promised to not walk away. God seemed to be longing to make this people that God had chosen a holy community, a community in right relationship with God and with one another and with all of God's creation. And so God told them how to do that by giving them these commandments. We could say they were God's top 10, the high points of God's law, written on, not on paper here, but on what? Stone, Stone tablets. Everybody could see them. Everybody could learn from them. Everyone could be taught by these stone tablets. But as I pointed to in that sermon, and I want to just briefly lift up again today, God gave those commandments to God's people only after reminding them of the relationship that existed between God and them. God said before any of the commandments, God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And I take that to mean God saying to them, remember that we're in this together. Remember what I did for you. Remember how I worked to free you from the things that were keeping you in bondage. And I think that's so important to remember, that before God gave any of these top ten rules to live by as people of God, God called the people to remember the relationship that existed between them, saying, I am the Lord your God, and I brought you out of the house of slavery. And then and only then did God tell them how they could do that. Griffin could, there, oops, could you, did I, is that the one? Nope, back one, I guess. I, that's the one I was looking for. Uh, so after God reminded them of the relationship that existed between them, God then gave them the commandments on these stone tablets for all to see. So that was covenant number three. Last week, we didn't talk about it, but it would have been covenant number four, which God made with David through which God promised that, again, through an unborn offspring, there would be a... <laughs> there would be a temple. David, would not, David wanted to build a temple for God. God said, no, your offspring that hasn't been born yet will build a temple for me, which Solomon, David's son, did. And God also promised David that through his offspring, that his offspring would rule forever and ever, be on the throne forever, through, um, which happened as we believe as Christians through David's great, 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 some number of greats, grandson, who was Jesus, yes. So today, so that would have been covenant number four, that's represented there by the temple, picture of the temple. So today, finally, we get to covenant number five, which is the new covenant. <laughs> and actually, so with all of that as background, because now your mind is muddled with all of these things, maybe not muddled, but filled with all of these covenants represented here, I'm going to read the scripture passage again. And I just invite you to listen as we've done before. I'm not going to ask for uh, responses this morning, but listen to see if there's a word, a feeling, a phrase, something that's stirred within you. I actually read this passage to a couple of people uh, at my office hours on Wednesday. It was after you had left, Bob. Um, just to get their impressions and their responses in terms of, I said, what strikes you or what do you hear in this? They were very different, what struck them, very different from what strikes me. And so I just invite you to um, pay attention because God 
speaks to all of us. God speaks through the snow. God speaks through nature. God speaks through music. God speaks through other people. God speaks through the scriptures, uh, can speak through the scriptures when we um, pay attention and listen. So I invite you to listen again and see if there's something that God speaks, God's spirit uh, speaks to you in these verses. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and remember their sin no more. So what I hear in those verses is hope. What I hear in those verses is promise. I hear commitment, God's commitment to God's people, God's steadfast, unwavering, unflinching commitment to God's people. No matter how consistently, how reliably, how regularly God's people throughout the Old Testament broke the covenant, and they did break it consistently and reliably and regularly and sometimes egregiously, effectively turning their backs on God time and time and time again, God did not walk away. God remained faithful to God's people. And what I hear in these verses is God promising again that God will not walk away. The day will come, God says, when I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. Instead of writing God's law on stone tablets, externally where all of God's people could see them and learn from them. God's going to write God's law directly on the hearts of God's people for all to know and for all to live. I will be their God, God goes on to say, and they shall be my people. Almost as if God is longing for that reality for that relationship. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Almost as if God is longing for the day when God's people are as committed to the relationship, as committed to the covenant, as God is. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Then God says, no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. No teaching will be necessary, because no learning is needed. God's people will know God, God's people will be in relationship with God, and will live and walk and love in the way of God. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It reminds me of God's covenant with Noah, which if you remember, you may, I'm going to assume you don't remember. I wondered that morning whether in part God made that promise to remind God's own self that God would never again completely give up on the people of God. God made a promise to the people, but also maybe to God's self. I am never going to flood the world again. No matter what they do, and I know what they can do, 
but I will never completely give up again. And here in Jeremiah, I wonder if, again, if God's self, if God is longing for the day when God's people will have God's law written on their hearts and won't need teaching, won't need to have the rules on stone tablets to look at. Because clearly, that day still hasn't come. We who count ourselves as among God's people, not just us, but all who count themselves as God's people, continue to break God's covenant. And we do it just as consistently, just as regularly, just as reliably, sometimes just as egregiously as God's people did in the time of Jeremiah. And sometimes it might feel like all of the covenant breaking or most of it is going on out there, over there, where we, some places where we can see that clearly and plainly people are breaking God's covenant and not living according to God's law of love. We just look at any news source anywhere, newspaper, online, radio, podcast, and we can very easily and quickly look here on our board, point to the places where they, whoever they are, that's not us, are really badly breaking God's covenant and living in ways and doing things that are clearly contrary to God's law of love. But it's here too. No one, I don't care who you are or how faithful we are, no one lives or loves fully from within this relationship with God. No one lives fully from God's law of love written clearly on our hearts. We all still need teaching. We all still need to learn. We all still need to be forgiven. But I think we can take comfort in hearing God's promises in these verses from Jeremiah. God's promise again to not walk away no matter what. God's promise again to remain a covenant partner with God's people, no matter what. God's steadfast, unwavering, unflinching promise, again, to remain faithful to God's people, no matter what. So I invite us to claim that promise, to accept God's forgiveness, to know ourselves in spite of what we do and don't do, say and don't say, and not just us, but us as the people of God, know ourselves as God's beloved, and to start again right now to live with God and with one another as people of the covenant. Amen. I invite you now into a few moments of stillness so that we might each have our own reflections.
As part of our response to God's word, I invite you to stand as you are able in body or in spirit and join in singing our hymn of response, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy, number 435. seated. Let us take this time to affirm our faith together. This comes from the Iona community, an ecumenical international Christian community based in Scotland and working for peace, justice, and the renewal of worship throughout the world. We believe, we believe that, that God, God is present in the darkness, darkness before the dawn, in, in the waiting and uncertainty where fear and courage joins hands, conflict and caring link arms, and the sun rises over places of struggle and walls topped with barbed wire. We believe in a God who sits down in our midst to share our humanity, and we affirm a faith that takes us beyond the safe and comfortable places into action, into vulnerability, and sometimes into the streets. We commit ourselves to work for change, starting with ourselves to bear responsibility, to take risks, to live boldly and courageously and risk humiliation, to see and stand with those on the edge, to choose life and allow ourselves to be used by the Spirit for God's new community of hope, peace, and love. Amen. As a community of faith, we move into a time of prayer now, sharing prayers with one another, uh, both concerns and joys. And I will lift up the prayers, which are many, as you can see on the prayer board that have already been shared. Uh, I'll also allow a brief period of silence if anyone would like to offer a prayer uh, that's not been shared on the board. Anytime you hear someone, me or anyone else, say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer, and we will uh, end our time of prayer together by praying the Lord's Prayer, using whatever words come from most naturally within each of us. I invite you to move with me into this time of prayer by joining in song, singing Nothing Can Trouble Two Times Through.
Holy God, we thank you for this time that we can be together in worship as a community of faith, as a community of your people. We thank you that we can be in this place, not only with one another, but with you, expecting an encounter with you in these moments. We thank you, God, for the strength that we receive and that we give to one another as we continue to come together as a community to worship, to sing, to reflect, to hear you, to listen for you, to pray together. Because, God, we admit that there are things that trouble us. There are things that frighten us. I pray, God, that you would continue to grow and expand within us until the day that you do fill us, that we are filled to the brim, filled to overflowing with your spirit, that our fear may decrease and our faith may increase. In the meantime, God, there are things, there are places in the world, there are places in our lives and our communities, there are places within ourselves where chaos seems to reign, places of confusion, places of grief, places of anger, places of violence, places of despair. We offer all of those places up to you this morning, almighty God, trusting that you are a God of peace, that you are a God who longs for healing and wholeness and reconciliation. And we acknowledge that there are too many places where those things don't seem present. Some of those things we lift up to you this morning, O oh God, from within this congregation. With so many people around the world, O oh God, we pray for Ukraine, for the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. We pray for the ongoing war and conflict in the Middle East between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. God, so many innocent people have been killed on both sides, but particularly in Gaza, particularly Palestinians. God, we pray for peace. We pray desperately for peace. We lift up conflict and violence in Sudan. For all these places, oh God, around the world, where there is violence and suffering, we lift them up to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up those from within our community, closer to home, who are also in need of healing and peace and strength. We lift up John, Jean's daughter, Sean, in her ongoing recovery, we lift up the family of Phil Leonard, who was killed on the truck route. We lift up Kyle as he continues to heal. We lift up our neighbors, in particular Bob and Susan Benjamin, Abby and her family. We lift up Gil and Louise George and Jeff as they continue their path of medical concerns and issues. We lift up George Burzens and Joyce as they continue to walk the path that has been set before them. We lift up Selma this morning and her shoulder. We lift up our friend Sam Elson and his wife Sonia as they uh, journey as Sam begins this treatment, uh, trial treatments for cancer. We lift up our sister Lorraine at the House of Fellowship this morning in particular as she is ill 
pray for healing, quick, quick healing within Lorraine. And we pray for Pastor Fred and our siblings at the House of Fellowship, for all of these dear and beloved people in our own lives, God, as well as those that we hold in our hearts. We offer them to you in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. We also pray for travel mercies, God, particularly in this time of increased snow. We pray that people who are traveling would be kept safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now hear our prayers, God, as we lift them from within either the silence of our hearts or from within this body out loud. We pray that you would hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. God, in the midst of all of these things that weigh us down, that cause, cause our spirits to feel heavy, we also acknowledge and give you thanks and praise for the things that bring us joy. We're so grateful for the moments, for the relationships, for the smiles, for the beauty around us that does give us joy and reminds us so much more easily of your goodness in the world and in our lives. On this morning in particular, we give you thanks for those who stewarded this land so well and for so long before we were here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the snow, the inches and inches and inches of snow that we've received recently and for the moisture that it provides to the land and for the beauty that it offers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, God, for all those who celebrate birthdays, particularly at this time of year. And we give you thanks this morning for Gil, for Ryan, for Jean, and for Jennifer in particular, for the ways that their lives are blessings to us and to all those around them. We ask your blessing on them as they begin this new year of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And hear these additional joys, God, that we share with you and with one another, whether in the silence of our hearts or out loud. For all these things, we give you thanks and praise. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now hear us, holy God, as we join not only our spirits together, but our voices, praying the prayer that Jesus continues to teach us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Another way that we respond to God's presence and care in our lives is by what we offer back to God, what we offer to the world in God's name. We share some of what we have given and been, uh, what we have received um, in order that others might know something of God's love and care through us. 
So I thank you for the ways that you offer all that you offer to White Rock Presbyterian Church and the ministries and mission that, uh, that we uh, participate in. And I also thank you for the ways that you um, offer to, to uh, ministries and missions outside of White Rock Presbyterian Church, including One Great Hour of Sharing, which the Presbyterian Church participates in, the, the large Presbyterian Church participates in uh, at this time of year. In the, typically receives this offering uh, Palm on Palm Sunday and Easter. Um, and if you would like to uh, contribute to that, you are invited to do that through White Rock Presbyterian Church. Um, and if you would like to know more about that, I will direct you to Rod McCabe, who uh, has, is um, well-versed in the uh, beneficiaries and the, the uses of the One Great Hour of Sharing offering. Uh, as we consider all that we have both received and that we all offer, uh, I invite you to stand and sing our praise to God by singing hymn number 605, Praise to God the Father. Thanksgiving. Thank you for giving me the morning. Thank you for every day that's new. Thank you that I can know my worries can be cast on you. Thank you for all my friends and brothers. Thank you for all the people that live. Thank you for even greatest enemies that I can forgive. Thank you, O oh Lord, you spoke unto us. Thank you that our words you care. Thank you, O oh Lord, you came among us, bread and wine to share. Thank you, O oh Lord, your love is boundless. Thank you that I am full of you. Thank you, you made me feel so glad and thankful as I do. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I want to thank Joyce for her leadership and worship this morning, and Griffin, who is back there manning the tech table all by himself. Thank you, Griffin. Thank you, Connie, for braving the roads this morning. They were a little treacherous coming down from Los Alamos this morning, uh, but she and I both made it. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for uh, braving the, the weather in White Rock uh, to be here this morning. There are a variety of ways to continue to participate in the life of this congregation, the life of this community of faith. Today you are invited to stay, every day, every Sunday you're invited to stay. Uh, this morning we hope that everyone can stay for a time of continued conversation and uh, cookies and drinks uh, in the fellowship room, the youth, the old youth room across the hall. Following that, starting around 11, um, we will adjourn into the ne room next door to have a conversation, continuing to conversation uh, using the book Where We Meet, uh, which is a Lenten study. Um, and the conversations in that class and that uh, time have been uh, lively and thoughtful. And uh, I invite anybody to stay, whether or not you've participated before, uh, for, those, for that conversation this morning. Uh, after that, if you stay for the class or if you go home and want to come back, there is a delicious 
corned beef and cabbage uh, St. Patrick's Day meal that will be shared, provided by Selma. Uh, and I believe she said there is plenty. So uh, whoever would like to either stay or come back, around 1230, we will be sharing a lovely, and you can probably smell it, delicious St. Patrick's Day celebratory meal to get lunch together. Um, uh, the only other thing I want to mention is that this coming Thursday is the last of the, the ecumenical Lenten programs. Uh, so if you have not been able to participate in those yet, this Thursday will be your last chance until next year. And as someone says each of those week, it's really a, a pretty unusual happening in a community that, that there are six, I think six, different churches of different denominations that come together they eat together, have classes together, and then worship together. It's really a wonderful opportunity. And so I, again, one more time, commend that to you all. Um, I think that is enough for today, announcement-wise. So I invite you to stand now to receive a charge from Joyce, followed by a blessing. And remember, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Christ's compassion shines forth in what you do. Live as those who know and have experienced God goodness. Go now in peace. Amen. Go now in peace. Amen. Let's let's sing. <laughs>